Evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us for the our usual monthly cerebrovascular skull base University of Miami uh, symposium. Uh, this is the 48th one today on October 13. And uh, I'll introduce our wonderful speakers in a, in a few minutes. Uh, but uh, first, uh, let me recognize, well, first, let me recognize my co-directors, uh, Carolina Benjamin, Mike Ivan, who's with us today, Bobby Stark, and our monthly panelist, our infolded fellow, Eva Wu, and uh, our post-residency fellow, Matthew Sun. Uh, Matthew is... Uh, came to us from UCLA and is uh, going to have a case to discuss with our panelists. And so is uh, Eva as well. She will show a case and, of course, we'll discuss your questions. Many thanks to the team that makes these uh, webinars now uh, uh, going since COVID times, really. And uh, I'm delighted to see many of you returning to watch us. And these are the links. Uh, if you are interested in viewing the pre -record, the recorded ones, they're all on our YouTube channel. You can also watch the webinars that my partner, Mike Ivan, has on brain tumors. Also a wonderful series of uh, webinars uh, that uh, we can spend hours watching. So for tonight, great pleasure to discuss, uh, I would say a partially controversial topic, which is the management of, uh, surge, of acoustic neuromas. Our first speaker, unfortunately, is not with us, but he just sent me an hour ago his pre-recorded presentation. He is stuck in an airport and is flying, and he, he's sorry he cannot be here, but he will be here virtually. And this is Dr. Ashok Astagiri, who's professor of neurosurgery, director of surgical neuro-oncology and skull base at UVA in Charlottesville. Following that 20-minute uh, presentation, I am delighted to have my very good friend and coming to us from the Czech Republic live. It's late for him, and I really appreciate Martin Sames, who is professor and chair of neurosurgery at University J.E. Perkini in Masaryk Hospital in the Czech Republic. And Martin, is going to Martin, Martin, of course, is does cerebrovascular and skull base. Tonight he's going to talk to us about planned subtotal resection and gamma knife radio surgery and what uh, their experience has been with the long-term results. And last but not least, uh, uh, Mustafa Bashkaya, who I'm sure all of you know uh, because he has a phenomenal uh, following on Twitter with all his educational uh, a series he does, but Mustafa is professor of neurosurgery, director of skull base surgery, neuroanatomical lab, microsurgical skills lab, uh, cerebrovascular fellowship, uh, and of course in Madison, Wisconsin. Mustafa, true to himself, will be very aggressive in his talk, and he's going to talk about aggressive microsurgery, refining the technique, and learning from mistakes. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing uh, and I'm going to play the pre-recorded presentation. Jacques and uh, the remainder of the organizers of this um, international webinar symposium, thank you for the opportunity to be able to join this esteemed panel in discussing determinants of best management of acoustic neuromas. I hope uh, by the end of this uh, uh, brief session, um, I will be able to have conveyed some of the ideas that, um, and thought process that goes into how I try to manage patients with acoustics and some of these considerations. Um, so I'm gonna provide just a, obviously to this uh, group a very brief a discussion of the options of management for acoustic neuroma. And then I'd like to really focus mostly on the types of patient factors or radiographic factors or clinical characteristics impact decisions about how to manage patients. And then I um, have a, a long-standing history and interest in patients uh, with NF2 
So I'd like to present a couple of slides um, uh, uh, specifically pertinent to that population, um, uh, which we know are some of the most difficult patients to manage with acoustic neuromas. Uh, you know, before I start, I want to say that um, the CNS uh, did put together a, a wonderful set of uh, review of literature and guidelines uh, that are readily available and free to access. Uh, you can download the CNS Plus app. Um, registration on that website is free. You can download it and uh, have access to some of the common questions and literature-based answers on uh, what would be supported with regards to standards of care. So, um, you know, obviously, before we start, I think that there are three main options for management of acoustic neuromas, right? Uh, we often think about surgery. Uh, that's uh, probably most of the discussion that we're going to have today. But of course, gamma knife is a form of surgery and radio surgery we're going to hear about as a tool either as an independent or a surgical adjunct um, to management of these types of tumors. And then the third option, you know, a lot of people refer to it as uh, watchful waiting. I like to refer to it as deferred risk because um, oftentimes when we're watchful waiting, what we're thinking about is not really having an increased risk associated with deferring surgery. And there are many situations in which deferred risk is appropriate. And I think that, um, you know, we'll, we'll get into a little bit of that. First thing I have to say is that I think the most important aspect of management and decision making with regards to acoustic neuromas is setting clear expectations and goals with the patients and also trying to do that for yourself so that there's a standardized approach that you cultivate and utilize in order to approach these tumors. And so, you know, what kind of things normally do we think about that help us determine how to best manage the patient? Well, obviously, I think a lot of this information is gained by a detailed history of physical examination, audiogram, and then obviously the imaging uh, provides a lot of additional information. When we think about the history and physical exam, obviously, I think one of the key factors in determining surgical versus non-surgical management or radiosurgical management is the presence of sin signs or symptoms. And then we think about um, how do we manage these tumors a little bit differently in NF2 or multiple neoplasia syndromes. Of course, age is a huge factor, uh, not only in the sense of overall health status and comorbidities, but we also know that the natural history seems to change a little bit for patients who are older and have small tumors. Certainly hearing status and findings on an audiogram are going to impact us greatly as we try to decide which strategy is best. And of course, um, important findings on imaging not only can help us decide what to do, but also Go back, going back to setting goals and expectations can help us understand a little bit about what prognosis may be in certain situations with respect to hearing and facial nerve preservation. So uh, let's talk a little bit, um, you know, about uh, obviously the audiogram. I think um, there's sort of a line in the sand that many of us use for determination of serviceable hearing, and that's uh, the 50-50 rule, 50 uh, decibels on pure tone audiometry, and then 50% speech discrimination score, and how serviceable and how, uh, uh, how much can we go uh, to try to preserve that. I think that certainly impacts our surgical approach and deciding whether to utilize radio surgery or not, and whether to utilize observation or not. And, um, you know, when we, when we get to what kind of imaging findings can impact um, things, I, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about, obviously, size, location, presence of a fundal cap of spinal fluid, and whether there are cystic changes in position of the jugular bulb relative to the tumor. But there are also many other findings on, on CT scans and MRIs that can help us, you know, just make surgery go more smoothly, trying to understand where emissary veins are, whether you have to really be worried about a spinal fluid or leak or not. You can see here the mastoid air cells don't even extend into our retrosignal approach on this case. We have uh, patients with, um, you know, multiple tumors trying, and we'll talk a little bit later about this, is how do we approach that situation? How does that alter our surgery and our uh, tactics with regards to treatment? And then obviously, you know, high resolution T2 imaging, I think has really revolutionized our ability to see nerves 
uh, whether they be lower cranial nerves or how tumors impact the fifth nerve, but also visualize peritumoral cysts and intratumoral cysts as well. Instead of sort of just going through a rigorous uh, uh, you know, flow chart in which we try to generate a systematic approach to treatment of these tumors, I'm going to um, try to go through it in a case-based way, which I think might be a little bit more fun and talk a lot, you know, provide a few little nuggets of information that may help you understand why I sort of chose certain management paradigms in certain situations. So the first case is a 50-year-old gentleman uh, with right-sided hearing loss, and uh, he has mild hearing loss. I mean, uh, mild dizziness. As you can see here, he has a speech discrimination score still 72%. Uh, the speech recognition threshold is 20 decibels, and you can see that he's just around the 50 decibels here. And so he has serviceable hearing, and his um, MRI uh, shows this tumor, uh, you know, sort of um, small to medium size, uh, presumed vestibular schwannoma. And the question is, you know, how do we approach that? I think, um, the, obviously, one of the things to consider, of course, is radiosurgery. Radiosurgery... Uh, since the seminal publication by Doug uh, Concioca, Dave Lunsford, and John Flickinger uh, in, in, in the early 90s with regards to long-term outcomes definitely showed that radiosurgery for these tumors uh, you know, uh, was uh, accompanied by extended uh, local control uh, of tumor as well as uh, hearing preservation. Um, and so I think that certainly that's... Uh, one consideration and follow up to this uh, was, uh, you know, a more recent article published uh, in JNS, um, you know, that's showing that hearing preservation could be uh, for extended periods of time with using radiosurgery, especially for Gardner Robertson one class hearing status preoperatively. So while that's the case, I think, um, you know, we have to think that there is some risk associated with even uh, utilization of gamma knife radiosurgery for treatment of these tumors. And so I would be a strong advocate for patients with marginal to no symptoms to utilize um, observation first. And so the reason I say this is uh, there has been there have been numerous studies that have shown that especially in patients who are elderly, that there is a significant proportion of tumors that will not progress. And so the question becomes, you know, is some treatment even necessary at all? When we think about goal setting, and expectations, and weighing whether we're actually providing a treatment that's helpful with regards to radiosurgery, there is no, um, there's certainly a risk associated with it. And I think that if we are treating a significant number of, of patients or tumors that really uh, are showing, will show no progression, then the question becomes, you know, how are we uh, benefiting these patients in any way? The second aspect of that is I think that patients um, will uh, have a significant, uh, uh, be significantly more amenable and accepting of risks associated with surgery or gamma knife if you show that their tumor is growing first. When, that, when the growth of the tumor occurs, patients understand the necessity for treatment. And so I always recommend a, uh, repeat imaging in six months as initial management for smaller to medium-sized tumors with no urgency for treatment. So in this situation, you know, this is the, this is the patient here, and then this is his follow-up several years later. Now, is this young man who's in his uh, 50s going to have a lifetime of no surgery and no risk? Um, maybe not, right? But I think that there are a number of patients who may have extended periods of time without requirement for surgery. And even if you get five or 10 years without having surgery, the necessity to have radiosurgery or surgery, the concept of deferred risk certainly makes it worthwhile that patients have that period of time without taking risk uh, and having the treatment. Second case I wanted to go through is a 49-year-old uh, woman who presented with right-sided tinnitus, hearing loss, and three months of right facial pain and a sense of imbalance. You can see very similar to the last case, you know, has excellent hearing in the right side, um, I'm meaning that she has a speech discrimination of 96%, and, um, and, and through the mid-frequencies, she still has preservation of good hearing function. When we take a look at the imaging, uh, uh, we can see that this is, again, another small to medium-sized tumor, 
and uh, we look at the T2, and you can see very clearly, especially near the top, that there is impaction of the fifth nerve, uh, presumably at the redentory zone, causing her trigeminal neuralgia. And you can also see on the T2 sequence, you can see some edema inside the middle cerebellar peduncle, and then you see a small cyst posteriorly as well. I think the, um, uh, everybody should understand that when we talk about initial observation, we're really talking about asymptomatic tumors. For this patient, obviously, retrosigmoid approach, uh, since a significant portion of the tumor is in the posterior fossa, was the, uh, uh, was the approach that I utilized. I oftentimes tell patients it's, it's about a, um, a, a 25 to 50% chance for uh, hearing loss associated with surgery. And um, that really manages expectations, but um, patients should, with this size of tumor, expect to have good facial nerve outcomes. Uh, and, and as long as we set those expectations, then we can move forward with surgery. The next case I have is a 52-year-old female with uh, left-sided hearing loss, blurred vision, and imbalance. I don't think for most of us the question here is whether we need to have an observation period or whether we can use gamma knife. It's rather, you know, what surgery is best and which approach is best. And I think that, um, you know, there are a number of uh, factors that we typically look at to try to understand which surgical approach might be best. Of course, uh, the two types of hearing preservation surgeries are retrosigmoid or middle fossa approach um, and, and um, you know, translab approaches uh, may be limited by high, high writing jugular bulbs uh, and required fat grafts. I think that um, there are a number of factors that you can look at to try to help you pick which surgical approach you're going to use in this patient. I put this case in specifically uh, because of the position of the jugular bulb. There are many cases in which the jugular bulb is even much more high riding and really limits not only uh, your view of the lower portion of the tumor, but maybe even of the, of the waist of the tumor itself. And so that distance between the middle cranial fossil floor and the tentorium and the jugular bulb is a key element to look at when you're trying to determine whether you can reach the bottom portion of the tumor. Certainly, so position of jugular bulb is an important one. Um, next, uh, with regards to hearing status, we discuss position of the tumor for me makes a big difference. When I see a majority of the tumor uh, in the posterior fossa, I lean towards doing the retrosigmoid approach. We do both approaches consistently, both translab and retrosig. But I think that uh, certainly one of, of one of the most important considerations is familiarity and ability. You can, you can have uh, the most important thing for many of these surgeries, especially, for example, for hearing outcome, I think the chance of hearing preservation, regardless of the approach you choose for the surgery, is very low. So a translab approach is certainly ex is, is extremely appropriate as long as you can manage the um, uh, uh, jugular bulb appropriately. And so there are, uh, you know, uh, things about expectation setting when we talk about how far out into the internal auditory canal is the tumor. I know that there are uh, uh, correlations with immediate facial nerve outcomes, so you can counsel patients appropriately with regards to that. And then also the chances of hearing preservation drop as the tumor extends more lateral and lateral into the internal auditory canal. Two points that you can, you can help set expectations with the patients. And as I said, you know, translab approaches for this type of tumor, it's not rolled out. There have been, you know, I, I think virtually every uh, operation, uh, the majority of operations done at the House Hearing Institute are done with the translab approach with better than excellent outcomes. And uh, it's through strategies of uh, managing high riding uh, jugular bulbs and uh, managing expectations that enable them to be extremely successful with utilizing translab approaches, even for extremely large tumors. And so um, with that, you know, I think that um, uh, it's, it's sort of half and half which approach you utilize. I tend to use, um, um, for a case such as that one, high riding jugular bulb, large tumor majority in the posterior fossa, I would like to use a retrosignal approach. Uh, next case I have is a 65-year-old uh, gentleman with tinnitus, hearing loss, and imbalance. And uh, when we take a look at this, uh, uh, you know, present you with the imaging here, you see a left-sided uh, uh, vestibular schwannoma with a rather large cyst associated with it. 
I think uh, traditionally surgery for tumors with large cysts has been the standard of care. And this is primarily because they are often space occupying symptomatic and the cyst can be associated with rapid growth. Certainly something we should tell patients when they lean towards wanting to do observation period. On the other hand, we know that they are associated with lower rates of complete resection and facial nerve outcomes may be inferior, at least in the immediate postoperative period compared to similar non-cystic schwannomas. Um, in this case, I did a retrosigmoid approach and we achieved a complete tumor resection. The patient is doing well with excellent facial nerve outcomes. Um, it does not have uh, uh, usable uh, hearing. But, you know, there, I wouldn't put this case up if it was just very straightforward, especially with more recent publications. So despite, you know, sort of the frequent admonition uh, that uh, most patients with cystic changes uh, should have surgery, I think that uh, re more recent literature has really raised questions about initial management for patients who are asymptomatic uh, with, uh, with moderate-sized cysts you know, can radio surgery be used in those circumstances? And certainly there are compelling publications uh, that suggest that that's very possible. And I think you just have to use uh, the presence of symptoms as an important bellwether and determinant of what surgical or management approach you want to try to utilize. Uh, last piece I have, hopefully I have a couple minutes here to talk about this one, is a 13-year-old gentleman with headaches, facial weakness, and hearing loss, and profound ataxia. His cranial imaging showed this uh, a massive uh, uh, acoustic neuroma. And then when we take a look and put that in perspective with what else we see in him, you know, we see this holocord pandemoma, multiple uh, schwannomas, and ventral to the spinal cord, you know, what do we do with a patient like this? Obviously, this patient has NF2, um, and that that plays in itself plays a critical role in how we want to uh, try to manage his uh, disease. We know that NF2 itself portends for worse treatment outcomes. You know, whereas we have 96% or above local control with radio surgery, we know that these uh, radio surgery success rates are much lower in patients with NF2 the longer we watch. You know, the recurrence rates are 60% even for small tumors with complete resection because we can't defeat the biology of disease simply with a knife. And so um, I want to talk a little bit about natural history and how these tumors are very different than our sporadic tumors. Obviously, we, I had the opportunity um, to, to monitor patients at a very young age, and we noticed that there were patients, oftentimes, uh, most patients with NF2 will have multiple tumors in the internal auditory canal that are coalescing. And, and essentially giving rise to this multilobulated appearance. We went on to remove these multilobulated tumors piecemeal, showing that there are actually polyclonal derivation and multiple tumors present. Um, and so by doing that, I think we better understand the natural history and also the treatment failures that occur with radio surgery when we're trying to treat five or more tumors at the same time. Of course, the probability of success is going to be 0.95 to the X really sort of mimicking what we see in practice. And so uh, there's still, I think, a role for gamma knife radiosurgery, even in the treatment of patients with NF2, especially if it can rightward shift some of this, because sometimes all we're trying to do is get procrastination. We know we're not curing the disease, and we know that medical therapeutics are hopefully advancing. Now, there's something about NF2 also that's very important is we need to be very critical about the question and the surgery that we're trying to accomplish because we know we're not curing disease with surgery. For example, so for example, in this situation, um, you know, I, this patient had uh, progressive hearing loss in her left ear, which was the only remaining ear. And uh, I elected to resect the small meningioma that you can see here. Um, on the left side and, and, and just decompress and do a bony decompression of the internal auditory canal. And you can see that she had significant improvement in her ear, uh, in her hearing, uh, which lasted almost 17 months. This is very analogous to middle fossa decompression for acoustics in NF2, a viable option, which uh, just requires us to think outside of the box about hearing management in these patients, which is very critical to their uh, uh, quality of life. Of course, we also have medical treatments that have been indicated in patients with NF2 with both tumor control and 50% of patients with hearing improvement, which only increases the armamentarium of um, opportunities for intervention. 
and makes it even more difficult for us to manage these patients. I think the key thing with NF2 is that uh, we need to be thoughtful and considerate about the different approaches that we can use and that their natural history is significantly different from the, the general population. And please, uh, although it's not our general approach in slow base surgery, when there is new cure, procrastination can be good enough in cases. In this situation, what did I do? I did a retrosigmoid approach, extended it down, and did multi-level hemilaminotomies and removed um, the majority of the internal uh, posterior fossa found into the tumor and then went down into the cervical spinal canal and removed all the ventral portion of tumor as well. And so, um, in summary, what I can say is as far as determinants of best management, I think the goal should be to be thoughtful, set goals and expectations, and try to stay up on surgical, radiosurgical, and medical advances that seem to be on a daily basis and can significantly modify how we approach and manage patients uh, with acoustic neuromas. Thank you for your attention. I think that was great. Uh, sorry, he is not, Ashok cannot be with us to answer questions. Uh, so we're going to move on uh, to Martin. Martin, if you could share your screen and unmute yourself, and hopefully it will work. Ah, perfect. And just unmute yourself. Perfect. Okay. Can you see my screen? Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. So my, my uh, title, it's a little provocative uh, about, um, about uh, long-term results after parasitization and gamma knife, but I will uh, criticize this, this approach because we have no long-term results about this policy. So if we, if we uh, criticize this approach, so I should show you how is our results and uh, show the long-term results of the, of the gamma knife, but let's move. It's not moving. So maybe here. Click on the screen, click on the presentation, you move. Yes. There you go. Okay, so uh, so we first I, I I show our our philosophy, our our operations philosophy and our results, and then we we will see that we have no results after gamma knife. So our philosophy is the large vestibular schwannoma. We do only by retro sigmoid approach in the sinking position. It's influence of the Majid Summit. Germany is very close to us. And um, uh, in the technique, just very shortly, we preserve the lower cranial nerves. Then we stimulate uh, dorsal part of the, of the tumor if there is no dorsal position, we do uh, the bulking, then identify facial nerve from the, from the brainstem, and then we drill the uh, canal and meatus. It's very important. We will see that some uh, uh, departments uh, doesn't do this. And then we go from both sides of the facial nerve and we remove the tumor by technique of the SAMI. It's a blunt technique or sometimes sharp if, if the blunt technique or elevation elevation of the tumor, it's not possible. And very important is a minimal stimulation threshold. If we have 0 0.05, so we can do radical resection. If we go higher and we have 0 0.3, so then we leave some film of the tumor, but leave the as less as thin of the film as possible, it's best for the long term, long term prognosis. So, uh, the, the just three examples. This is uh, a large vestibular schwannoma with very long meatus, very long uh, canal, and tumor here. So this is very, very demanding. But we should drill it. You can see they're removing the end of the tumor in total. It's not always possible. Radical resection. Next case, uh, cystic, we, we knew that adherence is more uh, here in, in cystic tumors, and we have only linear linear enhancement, so it means near total resection with very good long-term prognosis, and very huge tumor, but here is very favorable distal from the CSF gap, which is good for technique and also uh, radical resection. So, this is our philosophy, and uh, 
Of course, the preserved facial nerve is a priority. So the first conclusion is, is very important is that the minimal uh, stimulation threshold and if is higher than 0 0.2, so then we leave the film of the, of the, uh, on the nerve. This is a very important article. It's very strict and we can see that after gross radical resection, we have recurrence about 3.8 after five years. But if we do only subtotal resection, it means between 90 and 95 a volume of the tumor and so there is a 27, uh, 27 recurrence rate, which is very high. And we have same philosophy with the Professor Mastronari in Roma. So we did uh, our cooperative study. It's only a retrosic approach. This is years. We have uh, 57 patients and uh, we had 30% uh, of the cystic tumor. He has uh, age and we did 72% total or near total resection. And in this philosophy, we have 84% of the high uh, house Brackman one and two. So if we see on the literature in the radicality, we are in the middle comparing the other, other departments, but in the results, I think we have a very good results, 84. It's very good results for the house Brackman one, two. We had a good luck because dorsal position was, was very low of the facial nerve, no big complications, no mortality. And very important slide, we had 5% uh, recurrence after after five years, which is very important for comparing with the gamma knife philosophy. So if we if we conclude, so we have uh, this results and we have regrowth only five percent. And for the patients, the regrowth it's not nothing bad because it's only a radiological diagnosis. We see there is one millimeter more, so we uh, indicate radio surgery. And then for the patients, it's no complications. It's very smooth course of, 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 of this of this philosophy. And now if we compare with the different philosophy, which is a planet partial surgery, it's followed by radio surgery. So we criticize this, this approach. This, this approach uh, has appeared in 2003, but we have no long-term follow-up published in, in this, this philosophy. So we have only five years follow-up. Also, we mentioned already today the CNS recommendation. There is no evidence to support subtotal resection followed by radio surgery. It's a very important recommendation. And also mm. the literature, it's very, it's very sparse. So we have a, uh, from Japan, EUA, they rec uh, reported recurrence at the 14% comparing with the Radical surgery, it's, it's very high after five years. Then we have group in Netherlands. So they published if the patient is younger than 50 years old, the tumor regrowth is a 37%. And if the residual volume is greater than six um, uh, cubic centimeters, uh, also we grow around 40%. So it's, it's very, very high for the patients. And the third group from Lausanne, from Switzerland, they published a paper that resect only 69% of the volume. I think it's, it's very low. They don't opening uh, canal on the meatus. I don't understand how they operate these tumors if they don't see the, the facial nerve in the temporal bone. And they have a regrowth 8.5%, but after two years of follow-up. But the reoperation for these patients it's, it's very complicated because there is a swelling, there is this brainstem compression. So it's much more different than our philosophy recurrence. It's only gamma knife and patient doesn't feel anything. But for this patient, I think it's very complicated. And the, the next surgery with a, a swelling and the brainstem compression, it's very, very complicated. And they, this group from Switzerland, they, they published also this, this um, review, but there is incomplete data, diverse definitions of tumor control. So I think it's a no value of, of this systematic review. So if we conclude, so now we have two comparing, uh, two philosophies, heel, left side, low number of patients, very, very low, uh, very low follow-up. You can see if uh, 
there is a, re a remnant of the six uh, cubic centimeters. So the patient has 31 tumor progression. So it's, it's very high for, for the patients and the volume reduction is very important. But if you see that of the radical uh, philosophy, SANA, 2000, more than 2000 per, 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 uh, patients. And we see that after radical resection or knee total resection, there is a zero regrowth. And only if there is subtotal resection, there is 6% of regrowth. So I think it's a big difference in, in these two philosophies. And my uh, summary is that the, the vestibular schwannoma, large vestibular schwannoma, it's like, it's like uh, uh, climbing uh, the, the mountains. If you do the surgery, I think you, our aim is go at the top, which means radical resection. If there is a higher stimulation, so we can leave some film, but we bring to the patients very nice prognosis with a zero regrowth. Is there is a big adherence of the facial nerve, so we can leave the, the, the some remnants, but we we treat only six, five percent of regrowth. The philosophy to go on the base camp and don't to try to, to, to do the radical resection, I think it's not good philosophy because if we leave more than six cc, then we have 30% or 37% of the risk of the, of the recurrence. And the conclusion, so of course, radical resection and any price is no longer acceptable because facial nerve function is most important. It's, 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 very, it's very important, it's very clear for us. But primary goal should be complete removal or knee total resection if we do this surgery because it brings different cure of the patients. And um, plant, plant uh, partial resection followed by, by, by uh, gamma knife is not supported because we have no long-term results. We see only five years, no more. And uh, this surgery, I think, should be operated in competent, competent special centers with the patient for this beautiful surgery, but with target of the radical or knee total resection with very good results of the house Brackman. So this is our philosophy and more details is in this editorial in ACTA in one year ago. Thank you. Thanks, Martin. Thank you very much. I, I had to switch. I somehow lost connection in where I am. So I took my fellow's computer. Nice work. We will, uh, again, I forgot to say, please, uh, to the audience, put in your questions in the Q&A box and we will address them at the end. But uh, uh, for our third and final talk, Mustafa, go ahead and share your screen and start your talk. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, Martin Morcos, uh, my big brother and mentor, uh, congratulations uh, on your presidency of AANS. And thank you for having me. I like I also like to thank the distinguished speaker Ashok and Martin and the organizing committee and 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 uh, discussions. So uh, my role is to defend the aggressive microsurgery, but from my understanding, Martin also <laughs> I, I echo whatever he said. So I, I uh, and uh, he told I I thought he's going to talk about he's going to defend the this hybrid approach, but. Uh, Martin did very well. Thank you, Martin. <laughs> so uh, uh, I'm going to skip this. Ash Ashok and Martin all uh, all uh, discuss this. Uh, so these are the main treatment options. Observation is always reasonable and best option in some certain selected cases. Microsurgery to me is the gold standard. If you can remove, you should remove. And stereotactic radiation is a good option in certain cases, again. And planned intended subtotal resection and radiation, I'm complete, completely against it. I understand in certain cases, you cannot remove, you cannot remove, and then you can uh, either observe or radiate. But uh, if you go there with the in 
intended subclitoris action, I think you are doing disservice to the patient. So uh, my aims in the vestibular schwannoma surgery, maximal safe resection, but uh, aim of gross total resection, if not at least near total resection. And while you are doing this, preserving the facial nerve function and hearing preservation, uh, hearing function, and you shouldn't cause any mortality. We shouldn't even discuss about it and minimal postoperative morbidity. And that is, that is the facial or uh, 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 palsy or hearing loss. Uh, selection of approach, uh, all de depends on the hearing and the location of the tumor uh, in, the, uh, in relation to internal acoustic canal and in the cerebellar pontin angle. And this is two cases to show very similar cases uh, to show you how that fundal cap is important uh, in decision-making. Uh, this is one case, there's a nice fundal cap and the other one, there is no good fundal cap. You see, and one is good for middle fossa. The one, uh, although is larger, there is more more uh, 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 tumor in the CP angle. This is good for uh, uh, middle fossa. This is good for retrosigmoid because there is a fundal cap. So uh, uh, this is important, and you can achieve gross total resection in these cases. And, and preserve the hearing in uh, like I did in both, both cases. Is that I'm gonna skip all these advantage of the, my approach of choice is if I can, if hearing status is, is, is uh, uh, okay with this approach, uh, uh, trans labyrinthine approach, uh, but again, level of hearing, fundal cap, position of the sigmoid sinus, uh, uh, the uh, the size of the mastoid bone, contracted bone versus large large mastoid bone, and the uh, location of the sigmoid sinus, too anterior or too posterior, uh, and the experience of your sur uh, your surgical team, and then the look at the uh, the dominance of the sigmoid sinus transfer sinus uh, or absence of the sinus on the surgical side, but the size. Uh, I don't pay attention to the size when selecting the approach. Translabyrinthine approach briefly. Uh, uh, so you identify the internal acoustic canal and facial nerve very early and very wide dissection uh, uh, exposure of the internal acoustic canal. And please remember by doing the extensive internal acoustic canal drilling and dissection, you also devascularize the tum uh, tumor feeders coming from the dura, okay? There are two types of tumor feeders in the acoustic neuromas, extradural dural feeders and intradural coming from the aica. So, uh, and uh, in my opinion, uh, uh, translab uh, has, is associated with less CSF leaks and some uh, meta-analyses also concluded this, but uh, I'm not 100% sure I cannot substantiate with any data. And, and definitely almost no postoperative headaches. Disadvantage, you have difficulty in long tumors. The main difficulty, if tumor is long along the uh, cerebellar surface and the brainstem, it's hard to visualize medial uh, part of the tumor uh, uh, in unfavorable uh, uh, Petrus bone anatomy. And sometimes inferior exposure also limited. Again, the only contraindication active chronic otitis media or mastoiditis or very contracted small mastoid bone with the very anterior uh, uh, positioning position of the sigmoid sinus. A couple of case examples, 23 year old nursing home, a nursing uh, uh, school student. Uh, uh, so comes with this and I, we discussed, this is the, it's obvious, right? Uh, it's 23 year old, young. So you need to do your best to get this tumor out. And it's, it's sometimes I can predict the vascularity from the T2. And we know that this is gonna be hypervascular tumor, but same time we should preserve the facial nerve function. The hearing is not the question uh, and do the most radical resection you can. And I, I selected to go ahead with the translab approach. And uh, thanks to our uh, uh, neurotology colleagues, they do very wide, very nice exposures and good results. Uh, the gross total resection with the good uh, preservation of the facial nerve, fat packing, no complications after the surgery, 
and grade two early and, and grade one facial function and has been tumor free six years now. So uh, 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 size wasn't an issue. Juggler bulb is sometimes an issue in this, uh, but uh, you, there is a way of overcoming the high juggler bulb. Only thing you cannot overcome with the translab and high juggler bulb is if this is a diverticulum. Sometimes there is anomaly of the juggler bulb is a diverticulum and it goes protrudes into the canal that you cannot deflate it even if you drill the entire entire bone around it. Cystic tumors, five and a half centimeter, very high, you, you see. So we look into this cystic tumors. I don't think there's a the significant difference in facial nerve outcome and our study uh, 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 resulting in that way, uh, uh, find, find the same uh, 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 result. There is no really statistically significant difference between the cystic tumors and the solid tumors uh, in terms of facial nerve outcome. Again, translab approach, uh, uh, this patient had hydrocephaly, ventriculostomy was placed during the surgery, and, and the fat packing, gross total resection with the good facial outcome has been tumor-free 10 years. Same thing, cystic tumors. Uh, this is not truly cystic tumors. We shouldn't mix cystic tumors with this uh, uh, arachnoid space entrapments. This is a solid tumor with this CSF entrapment. Uh, so TransLab provides provides a better exposure in my uh, in my experience, less uh, uh, exposure of the cerebellum, almost purely epidural approach. You don't even need to see the epidural ep uh, uh, cerebellum. Uh, the only disadvantage is the seeing the most medial parts in some unfavorable anatomical uh, uh, variations. Retrosigmoid is a workhorse. I'm not against it, and I still do it uh, in cases that I like to preserve the hearing or in cases that I need a short exposure time. If patient is elderly, and I just want to go there to decompress the uh, eight-year-old with large acoustic, you want to just decompress and buy time, that's perfect approach. And for perfect uh, approach for hearing preservation with the fundal cap. Uh, so a uh, couple of examples for that. Again, the hearing loss, small tumor, uh, uh, and there's a nice fundal cap, good result, grade two, grade one in three months, a gross total resection with the hearing preservation. Large tumor, I went there for, to, do, to preserve the hearing because she's young, uh, uh, but I wasn't able to preserve the hearing, but we had the good facial uh, outcome with the a good facial uh, outcome, but no, we lost the hearing, unfortunately. And a couple of cases that uh, uh, retrosigmoid approach was used uh, uh, for at the other centers for tumor debulking. And this is one of the case, 40 year old female, uh, 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 subtotal resection at the center that acoustic neuroma was born. And I'm embarrassed to show this case, unfortunately, but. Uh, uh, so retrosigmoid approach, normal hearing, loss to hearing after surgery, and follow-up, tumor growth. They recommend stereotactic radiation for this, gamma knife. And now patient also has a trigeminal neuralgia. Look at that, like the case Ash Ashok showed, uh, the kinking of the trigeminal nerve at the system by the tumor, severe. Uh, uh, and this is the perfect case for translab. You want to come virgin. So you don't want to go through that retrosigmoid and, and more ventral approach, presigmoid uh, uh, drilling. And then this is the thing. I'm cutting the superior vestibular nerve there and initial debulking. And I don't see cerebellum here. See, and always sharp dissection. You should do the acoustic neuroma surgery like you are doing insular glioma or AVM. Okay, sharp dissection around the nerve, near the nerve. And, and no traction or blunt dissection and debulking and going back to the dissection. Okay, these are very sharp, flat dissectors and, and with samurai scissors creating a plane. And this is this, my suction hand. This is the hand, uh, non-dominant hand, but this is the most important hand. And I learned this from Jacques Morcos. Uh, you can adjust the suction, the suction severity with your thumb and it should be subconscious level 
and you get used to it and you keep doing it. I can't, I, you see, I'm suctioning the facial nerve and no irritation potentials at all because I'm adjusting as I need it, okay? So uh, again, I'm showing the, I'm gonna skip this. Dissection of the facial nerve was not the issue here, but the tumor more was more adherent to the trigeminal nerve and we got that part and, and immediate relief after surgery. This is the trigeminal nerve. And I'm moving traction, contra-traction on the, on the trigeminal nerve. Trigeminal nerve is different, can tolerate the traction, but facial nerve, six nerve, others cannot, okay? So uh, we'll go through this and, and get the final uh, piece of the tumor out. Facial nerve stimulates that 0 0.05, very good prognostic factor and gross total resection, good facial outcome, and immediate relief. Like hours after surgery, she, she didn't have any facial pain anymore. Another case, 31-year-old, debulking, recommended radio surgery. He wants to think about it, wait a couple of years. Tumor is now bigger, and we removed the translab. Again, retro -sick initially, we came with the translab. Uh, even though slightly higher jugular bulb, good results. 55-year-old in Europe, retrosigmoid craniotomy, subtotal resection. Uh, we don't have the in original pre-ops. They leave this uh, uh, tumor, gamma knife, stereotactic radiation. Two years later, tumor is bigger. Why did they do all these? Very unnecessary. Translab, virgin, virgin site. Uh, and become grade three, post of day one, grade one in two months. Same 60 year old with hearing loss and uh, walking difficulty, subtotal resection, cyber knife, and tumor grows again. And young patient, why you subject patient to the two treatments and you still have the growth, okay? Post gamma knife, same thing, okay? I, I, I understand, you know, some tumors you can, you can control the, uh, and some of them, you, tumor control means no growth, right? Maybe tumor naturally wouldn't grow if you leave it, uh, you left it alone. So again, the same thing, gross total resection, grade two facial function long-term. Do I have failures? Yes, not, not complications though, okay? You cannot have major complications in, this case, in these cases. So large tumor, very depressive, uh, obese and diabetic patient, I went there for the same goal, gross total resection. But like Martin mentioned, uh, tumor, you start stimulating the facial nerve higher and higher. It's time to stop. You know that for this patient with the severe depression, the facial nerve function will be very important. I, could I have pushed it? Yes, but we left tiny tumor here and uh, near total resection. And the, she had the good outcome. It, it was... Uh, Retro sigmoid though, patient also had good hearing. I in the retro sigmoid, I worry about the growth because with the even though you drill the canal, you cannot get the extra uh, dural dural feeders that much. So I'll watch these patients at least 15, 20 years. So and this patient is the same uh, large tumor uh, and uh, no hearing translab, and I had to leave this tumor because he told me his facial function is important to him and I shouldn't push and it starts stimulating higher signals. So it's time to stop near total resection. This is a very recent case, another failure of the approach, cho choosing the wrong approach, okay? 29 year old, I went there, I thought I can get it, but this was my main concern, this long tumor along the cerebellar surface and the brainstem. I said, I will try the uh, translap, we tried it, Failure. What should I do? Should I radiate? No way. We'll come back. We do retro sigmoid because the difficulty was I wasn't able to see the medial part of the tumor. Okay. So uh, bear with me. This is it. So this is like a, operating in ABMs. Okay. These are these are arteries. You have to skeletonize them, and they give tiny feeders to the tumor. You just take the side feeders to the tumor. Leave the arteries alone. Okay. And, and same with the nerves, okay? 
and go around it, sharp dissection, only sharp dissection along the nerves, peeling, spreading, and, 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 and blunt dissection, you can do other, other locations, okay? So I'm getting around it, and, and I'm close to the arteries there, you see, and that's the area of the uh, 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 facial nerve. I'm coming close, and lower cranial nerves, and that this is the canal now. I'm going. I need to find the facial nerve, right? I go change my planes back and forth between canal and the brainstem, cerebellum side, and and this is the, and I leave the cochlear nerve intact for a while, and then I cut it. Okay, at the in the canal side, I cut it at the brainstem to identify the dorsal root enterosal of the facial nerve. There's always an ICA loop between, these are lower cranial. This is actually six nerve, you see. Six nerve had two branches here. When it, as it came out from the brainstem, that there were two branch of the six nerve. That's also very rare variations, okay? Keep in your mind. And this is, and again, the facial nerve, how it's played and sharp dissection around it. Arachnoid knife to create a plane between facial nerve and the tumor capsule. This is the only chance you have. Uh, this patient is 29 year old. You have to give her a gross total or near total resection. That's best for her. You cannot just say, I cannot do it. Then why did you become a neurosurgeon? Okay, traction, contra-traction. This is all brainstem. I am beyond the facial nerve, ventral to the facial nerve there, and debulking, bringing the, making the tumor smaller. And this is the facial nerve again. Okay. I found this samurai sharp dissectors. I use uh, arachnoid knife, samurai dissectors or samurai scissors all the time. And, and now I am winning. I got the arachnoid plane on the other side of the nerve. That's it. And we'll stimulate the nerve. It's too, I think this, this case stimulated the point one, uh, but she woke up perfectly fine. Gross total resection and great one facial uh, function. And this is, this is a forgotten function, okay? Nobody mentions about the function of the nervous intermediates. That's very important to do some patients, especially the tumor smaller than two centimeter, if they didn't lose and compensate for their taste function, they, they, their life becomes miserable. They cannot taste anything. And unfortunately, we don't mention, and please pay attention to the nervous intermediates. I'm going to show it to the anatomy for the young guys. So this is the nervous intermediates. And smaller tumors, smaller than two centimeters, you can preserve it. If the function is gone, larger tumors, don't worry about it. And patients won't notice that. If they notice it, and if you can preserve it, it's perfect and tumor smaller than two centimeters, you look for it and you try to preserve it. So I don't wanna take more time, I stop here. And this is again, the uh, uh, perfect outcome. He didn't have a hearing, uh, uh, functional hearing and good functional outcome. So again, these are all, I think cliche, you know, choose the right approach, but over time this comes, okay? And my preference, preference doing the translap in cases that anatomy allows me to do it. And if I fail, I'll come back. I'm not going to give up. And anatomy is always best uh, and your best friend and following the microsurgical principles set by our pioneers, like you are doing uh, AVM aneurysms or acoustic or petroclial meningioma. And I like to use these adjuncts uh, uh, to identify the facial nerve. I learned this from Fukushima and I use sodium nit nitroprusside to overcome the vasospasm. 
And so if you look at the, this is a very rough data, but uh, uh, you know, how is my, how am I doing, right? Uh, so tumors greater than 2.5 centimeter, our facial nerve preservation rate is higher than 90%. And, and tumors smaller than 2.5 centimeter near 100 percent. And uh, uh, no mortality, no major morbidity. And CSF leak rate is around two percent with the abdominal fat grafts in the uh, in the trans labs and the lumbar drains. And one point I want to I want to stress, you know, this we think that a facial nerve may affect. Uh, uh, you know, patients' postoperative uh, functional status or, or how they feel about uh, uh, their uh, current functional status. So Mayo Clinic actually look at this. If you leave tumor behind, even they have good facial outcome, they don't feel that great. They feel more anxious. And if you ask these patients, they will tell you, every time I came for the checkups, I, I start getting very anxious. Is my tumor growing? Is my tumor growing? And the ones you did the growth totalization, uh, they are they they are they feel much more relaxed. So uh, this is important factor, and we need to pay attention to these kind of factors too. So the, at at the end, for the young young guys, please go to the lab. All dissection, micro neurosurgery, whatever you are doing spinal surgery or peripheral nerve surgery or intracranial microsurgery, spend time in the lab. And that's the best, best thing you can do. You, you, in Miami, you guys have wonderful lab. So use it. And this is our lab and we welcome everybody. If I took too much time, I apologize. Thank you. Uh, and happy to ha have any questions if you guys ask me. Thank, thank you, Mustafa. Very nice, of course, as always beautiful surgical technique. Um, uh, you know, my, maybe while I'll ask Eva to show a case, but maybe I can ask Mike, uh, my partner who does also a large number of acoustics. Mike, do you want to ask the panelists anything or comment on anything while Eva is? Sure, is yeah, no, that was great. The both talks, or all three talks were just fantastic. I mean, really just highlighting the, the points uh, that I think, all residents and, and early faculty should really kind of take to heart and uh, and, and we, we kind of follow the same track of being aggressive the first time around, especially when they're small uh, here as well. The one question I wanted to have is just kind of some of the, the details that you both touched about um, with the resection and stimulation and your response to stimulation of the facial nerve as you're going through the course. Uh, you know, it's, there's definitely some nuances to that. Uh, you know, we all start at 0.05, but I think Martin uh, talked about it a little bit and stuff as well. What are your thresholds when you when you stimulate? Do you stimulate first at the root entry zone, and then you find it in the uh, you know distal end, and then when you when you start seeing that you're not stimulating as well, either with the frequency or you have to go up on the stimulation, what is your kind of your your moves there? Do you go back to the root entry zone? And you always compare it there. And when you go up by, I think Martin was talking about going up by 0.02 or 0.03, that was kind of the, the error or the concerning time where you felt like you need to kind of reassess this idea of leaving a small layer on it. I just wonder if we could just talk about those nuances. Uh, Martin, are you, I don't see you on video. Oh yeah, you're there. Un Did you hear Mike's questions? Uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. So very important is in stimulation from the brainstem, of course, higher frequency. We have a, a neuroscience, very easy one, and we always start 0 0.05. And if you manipulate the nerve, uh, Mustafa shows us beautiful, the sharp dissection. It's it's fantastic mm -hmm. instrument. And of course, you, you manipulate with the nerve. So if if 0 0.5, it's not, it's not enough. So we go 0 0.2. It's okay, but if I need more, so I am very, I am very careful, and then I don't attack more the, the interface between the nerve and the and the, the tumor, and I, I try to leave the, the film and we thin by by cruiser or by, some, uh, by scissors to make the, the the film as as thin as possible. So, so if you so whenever you get up to point zero seven, is your kind of that's when you start to kind of 
scale it back a little bit is what you're saying yeah 0 0.3 it's it's too much so then i uh i plant the leaf some some film yeah 0 0.2. 0.2 it's it's 0 0.2 okay mm -hmm. mustafa what, what are your thoughts on that uh, I do the same. I mean, you start with the lowest possible and you stimulate at the brain. If first, always find the brain stem. And if it is stimulating nicely, you you know, the, pick a pick a couple of points. And stimulation is affected by few things: CSF, blood. Uh, you have to be you, the, the the where you are stimulating. It should be dry. And if you are going high. First, make sure your stimulator, your field is dry, uh, and and if if it is not, if you still is going high, stop doing anything. I put, I just irrigate with the nitrite, put the nitrite soaked gel foams, and wait a little bit, and do dissect. If I have other tumor parts, I need to work. I work on those parts without irritating the nerve. And you can also watch the irritation, irritation potentials right there kind of fibrillation uh, and if i'm going higher and higher higher 2.2 point, point two, uh, if i'm stimulating at point 0.2 uh, that's a very good warning sign and I'll, i will stop there but sometimes uh, it goes suddenly goes flat you stimulate 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 if you are at the really advanced in your dissection and you this was the last piece and it was stimulating nicely and now you are living like a tiny piece the question i always face and i don't know the right answer should i get the last piece since i lost it i lost the potentials right or should i go leave i mean leave some piece there and uh, Mustafa, don't you think it dip, you know, particularly in experienced hands like yours, it depends what you think the actual uh, etiology of losing that signal, if it's correct. blood supply as opposed to a bad traction. So I, I would treat it differently when I'm doing it, you know. Exactly. So, you know, if you take the vascularity, you know that as the surgeon. Uh, and exactly that you should not do. <laughs> right. Uh, and you you know it's gonna go out immediately. But if it is traction, you know you know that too. That fibrillation goes off. That that irritation potentials, and wait until it, they stop. It stimulates. Keep going. And but again, don't push your luck, especially the young patients. And you can wait a little bit. And yeah, sometimes we wait the yeah. A patient wakes up perfectly fine. And you you think you are confident you, when you you can go back and clean more, you get that sense too. Some there are some tumors, you say that there's no way I can remove this tumor without damaging the patient nerve, right? There's no point coming back, but you get that feeling. I go back. I didn't blink my eyes to go back second time. Patient wakes up fine. Patient nerve is good. Take take the patient back. Do the complete resection. Yeah, no, those, those are great comments. And the only thing I wanted to add was just, you know, and you both showed it in your dissections is maintaining that that really nice plane is so key when you're talking about stimulating, because as soon as you lose that plane between the facial nerve and the capsule, it becomes a real, it real, like very difficult to kind of rely on, on that, that stimulation. And so it's so great, but you guys both obviously have excellent technique and that was demonstrated. So thank you again for your talks. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Eva, do you want to show the yeah. case? Yeah, so this is, you can see my screen, right? Yes. So, yes. Yeah, so this is similar to the case that Dr. Bushkaya was talking about, about the, so I'll tell you about the case. So it's a 64-year-old uh, woman who actually initially had an incidentally discovered right acoustic neuroma in 2011 after she was uh, indoor surfing and then had a fall. And so she had imaging done for the fall and it showed this uh, acoustic neuroma on the right side. And at that time, she actually had hypoacusis and tinnitus as well. And so she went to another hospital. They ended up doing gamma knife a year later in 2012. And then two years after she actually developed um, uh, two years after Gamma Knife, she actually developed this right-sided V2, V3 dull burning pain that lasted a few seconds and was triggered by stress. And so 
she we don't have the initial MRI, uh, but this was the MRI that she had in 2014, which was about two years after her gamma knife. And you can see here that there's not much of a uh, fundal cap or anything here. And the acoustics pressing on the trigeminal nerve. And so uh, you can see here um, she was being followed at the outside hospital where she got her gamma knife with serial MRIs. And so they got an MRI in 2017, 2019, 2022. And so uh, in 2017 was five years after her gamma knife. And so at the time her pain was still about the same dull burning. And so you can see here, you know, the lesion has decreased in size a little bit. It's still compressing on the trigeminal nerve uh, a little bit here. Then in 2019, she actually started having this new sharp stabbing pain that was different than before in addition to this dull burning pain and you know it, the triggers now were uh, when she would talk when she would chew and brushing her teeth and so at that time you know she had actually been seen in our clinic and so if, if you look on the MRI in 2019 it looks to be smaller than the one in 2017 but it's still pushing on the trigeminal nerve and so you know we offered her intervention uh, she actually didn't want any at that time because she um, you know, was worried about facial nerve function and hearing. And so we tried uh, Tegretol, which helped with her pain. And so that helped until uh, a few years later in 2022, she actually presented to us again with even worsening pain. And so now she was unable to talk or eat given the pain and she had tried multiple different medications. It didn't help. And so if you see in 2022, the lesion's actually gotten a lot smaller now. And so, um, and uh, the, the tumor is, compressing trigeminal nerve a little bit, but now there's like this possible vascular loop right here that's compressing the trigeminal nerve. And so I'll show you um, the, the coronal. And so here's the coronal. So you can see trigeminal nerve is here, SCA for, is compressing from above and the uh, tumor is compressing um, cranial nerve five from below. And so, you know, we wanted to ask the panelists to see, you know, in this patient that had this 64 year old woman who had this right acoustic neuroma, had gamma knife 10 years ago, the lesion's actually decreasing in size, but she's developing, you know, worsening trigeminal neuralgia, um, you know, and uh, on imaging, you see that the tumor's compressing five, and then there's also a possible uh, vessel loop that's compressing it as well. And, you know, she's really worried about, um, intervention because of facial nerve function and you know she doesn't want any more decreased hearing than she already has and so you know what management options would you do and so here are the key images um, from each of the years. Ma Martin what shall we do the gamma knife seems to be working in decreasing the tumor size 10 <clears throat> years later yet trigeminal neuralgia how do we differentiate trigeminal neuropathy for radiation induced versus a true mechanical, you know, well, either tumor or arterial compression, what would you do? Uh, I think it, it should be both the, the microvascular compression and the tumor also, if, if I see well. So I will discuss the patient if, if, if she agree. So I think it is good indication for surgery for retrosigmoid in, in my opinion and there is a two reason to decompress the nerve from the ca and uh, also we can remove the tumor so we don't see many adhesions after gamma knife so i expect more difficult uh, situation but it's it's possible mustafa prefers translap if i understand if it's after gamma knife, the patient, is it, is it true? No, if patient has a good hearing, uh, and I think I can preserve the hearing in it, and I will do retro sick. Yeah, yeah. But patient has no hearing, no serviceable hearing, or hearing at the very, like a 50%, just borderline, I discussed the options between retro sigmoid and trans lab. On mm -hmm. those cases, patient, patient has, the, you know, very borderline hearing, and also, a, we look at the ABRs and bad ABRs, chance of hearing preservation uh, is almost impossible. Yeah. So, so my my opinion, I would discuss with the patient. If if she agree, I would I would suggest the retrosic approach for what, this. What would be 
Uh, Martin, what is the goal of your surgery? You go in with the intention of doing what? I think the main indication is um, neuralgia, trigeminal neuralgia, and uh, medication, it's not sufficient. And there is compression by SCA, and there is compression by the tumor also. So, so would be would it be your goal to be to do a gross total resection of the tumor, or you can decide when you're there? Or I think uh, the main problem is the trigeminal neuralgia now, I think, because the, <clears throat> right. the tumor doesn't grow. So I think it's I think now it's not necessary to do to do radical resection because the tumor it's uh, it's decreasing in the volume. I think right, it is, yeah. it is. So I, I would, what, oh sorry, go ahead. I, I would concentrate on the, the, the compression of the trigeminal nerve and <clears throat> microvascular decompression. Okay, Mustafa, mm. same goal or what? Uh, I I I'd like to ask more questions about the patient. So, uh, hearing is still okay. Yeah, she still has hearing, so uh, she's able to hear from the telephone and everything. They didn't. We didn't get a formal like audiogram, but. Okay. And then uh, how is your uh, exam, uh, uh, trigeminal exam, does she have uh, any sign of, you know, decreased sensation? No, no numbness. Corneal? Yeah. No, it was all normal, except for just decreased hearing on the right. But, but, but just to tell the audience, this is a very good question that Mustafa poses because probably could partially at least differentiate radiation yeah. injury from a classic trigeminal neuralgia, the presence or absence of trigeminal deficits. So it's, it, you know, we, you know, assumption is if she has a, a trigeminal neuropathy, right, from the radiation, you should have uh, more signs uh, than the just pain. Uh, and uh, if patient is, I'm convinced that this is a truly trigeminal neuralgia, secondary to the tumor compression, I will, I will, resect radically, uh, not maybe with the aim of the gross total resection uh, and the decompress the uh, trigeminal nerve same time. Uh, by, I think by removing the most of the tumor, you'll decompress this trigeminal nerve. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, one second. Ignacio, can you hear us? I notice my colleague, yes. Fred, Fred Telishi, my the chair of ENT, my colleague, neuroautologist, is here with us. Uh, I, uh, uh, do you think you can, uh, what do you call it, promote him to panelist? I Ignacio, you're Telishi. Yes, you're yes. What's his last name? Telishi, T E L I S H I. Unless he doesn't want to, we're going to find out very soon. <laughs> we're going to promote him. And if he turns his video off, it means he's not, he cannot join us. But He's asking a question, Eva, where specifically does she localize the pain? So just the V2, V3 distribution. Okay. In the dull burning pain is V2, V3 distribution, and the sharp pain that she started having is also the same distribution as well. Okay. Mike, how, how would you handle this case? Mike, Ivan. Yeah, no, I, I agree with what been said. I mean, I think that uh, surgery would definitely be uh, the, the best option to kind of give her the best chance for pain relief. The, the questions that would been posed are key because, you know, if you look at that 2022 scan, you could see that the, the fifth nerve is actually doesn't appear to be as compressed. There's a vessel there, but it's it's less compressed than it definitely was in the past. So the question is, you know, when you get in there and if you find the tumor has retracted off of it, um, and there's not really a vessel on it, what else do you do? Do you do a neurolysis, a little bit of neurolysis of that of that fifth nerve or not? Right. Uh, with the idea that it's some some radiation effects. And I think that would be things I would discuss with the patient beforehand. Fred, it's good to have you. Fred, for the audience who may not know him, he's a, a new, a chair of ENT here with us, my colleague of more than 25 years. Uh, um, Fred, interesting, huh? shrinking tumor with gamma knife yet trigeminal neuropathy. What, 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 are, what were your thoughts or what are your thoughts? Well, yeah, I don't see, first of all, thanks for having us. Uh, we actually have our whole group here. We canceled, we postponed our journal club so that we could all attend. So the whole oh, group. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. 
I was um, I was going to say so many bad things about neuroautologists. Now you're forcing me to be nice. Now you can. <laughs> And then great to hear uh, and see Dr. Telishi. I had an opportunity to scrub with him many, many cases. I learned a lot from him. More than Jacques Morcos. Well, that's the last time I'm inviting you. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, Fred. Tell us your thoughts. Oh, are you muted, Fred? We can't hear you. Yeah, you're muted. Yes, muted. No, it's my headset that does ah, that. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, yeah, this headset does that. No, Mustafa, it's good to see you. Uh, and I'm glad that you have such a great relationship with your neurotologist who gives you those big giant views via the TransLab approach. <clears throat> yes, thank you, sir. Yeah, I, I mean, what other option is there for this patient? I mean, you know, inject Botox or do some, you know, crazy stuff. Uh, it seems it seems like there's really only one option to uh, to do tumor resection for them and hope that it it you know removing the pressure and do some other manipulations is helpful for them. Yeah, uh, if Eva, just for the sake of time, why yes. don't you continue? So we don't have the uh, operative video, but what we did was exactly what all the panelists said, and so we uh, went in, got about 75% uh, the bulking of the tumor just so we could decompress trigeminal nerve, which is right here. And so you can see it's pretty well decompressed. And then I'll show you the uh, coronal as well. And then once, you know, once we decompressed the trigeminal nerve, we started ex exploring the trigeminal nerve to see if there was a um, vessel loop that was compressing it. And so here you'll see here, um, there was this uh, duplicated SCA that's gonna come up right here that we put a piece of Teflon in between uh, five and the vessel loop here. And then there's that Teflon here, and then there's another piece of Teflon. And so the patient actually did really well post-op. She was discharged on post-op day one, and then she had some new transient right V1 um, you know, numbness that resolved at follow-up. And then at follow-up, she was able to be weaned off all medications and her trigeminal neuralgia completely resolved. She was one of those patients who absolutely did, I mean, did not even want to hear of the possibility of a facial palsy or, or losing hearing, which is why we were conservative. But, you know, if Peter Janetta was alive today, he would love this case because he always used to say, even if there is a tumor causing trigeminal neuralgia, it's not the tumor, it's an artery that the tumor is pushing on the nerve that's doing it. And, and this, well, indeed was the case. Uh, I don't know why it became more obvious when it shrank, maybe some form of traction or something, but that's, we thought that's interesting. Jacques, the reason I asked about the specific location of the pain, uh, you know, we all remember the Hitzelberger sign with the sensory branch of the facial nerve in the canal. And if this had been localized really to the ear, you know, specifically ear pain, we have a procedure, a transmastoid procedure to resect that little nerve. And frequently that, that helps in selected cases to remove the otalgia. But this is obviously a different situation. Right. Very. May, very I, may I ask you the, the technique of the microvascular decompression? You, you do interposition of the, of, the, of the Teflon or you move the vessel from the nerve? Uh, I do both. I probably do what Fukushima used to call the bridge technique. Uh -huh. So I, 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 you know, skeletonize the arachnoid, I mean, the artery completely in a yes. way. It's, and then I put, I like usually a triangular or rectangular piece of Teflon, you know, as a bridge, as opposed to stuffing yeah. it. To create the, the nerve absolutely free. I think it's better than. In yeah. The yeah. She was very happy. Pain completely mm. gone. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Uh, Matt, are you ready with your case? Yeah, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen now. Can everyone see? Okay, um, so this is a case of a 12-year-old girl who presented with one year of progressive right, worse than left side, hearing loss and imbalance, also newly diagnosed with NF2 um, and found to have bilateral vestibular schwannomas. On exam, she, in addition to um, bi bilateral papilledema, although she had normal vision, she had horizontal nystagmus 
And um, on um, uh, hearing test, she only had 4% word uh, recognition score on the right side. And then outpatient, uh, she was started on uh, steroids and uh, Diamox. And so here's the uh, screenshots of the scan and I'll show you the scroll through. So T on the contrast, much larger tumor on the right side, and then um, T2 coronal and axial. And um, here's a CT of the temporal bone for those that are interested. And you can kind of see a hint of, you know, possibility of high writing a jugular bulb on the coronal of the CT temporal bone. Um, so question for the panelist um, speakers, uh, what would you do for this patient? Martin, to, what's, your, what's your approach to those young patients with tough NF2 tumors? How is the hearing, uh, the, the sides? Uh, on the right side, practically non-existent, and left side is really bad, too. And left side is better for hearing? It's better, but it's not really. Yes, but within weeks, um, you know, this, this case has been co-managed by another one of my neuroautology colleagues, Christine Din. Uh, she noted like a rapid uh, hearing loss by the time we operated on her she was almost essentially deaf on both sides. Hmm. So I, I would I would start with the right side, the large, large uh, the uh, schwannoma, and then of course we we try to preserve the hearing as 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 much as possible. So the left side. Uh, the second uh, second uh, time the treatment, but maybe yeah, right side radical resection of course, and the left side I would try to ask gamma knife how they how they see the, the chance the prolonged hearing, and we will discuss the left side about gamma knife or or surgery, but but later. If there is some hearing, I, I would try to uh, uh, preserve the hearing with a conservative approach. But if there is hearing loss, so we should decide very quickly on the left side if we have a knife or surgery too. Hmm. So M Mustafa, what the, before you tell us your surgical ideas, if the family told you, are there any non-surgical ways to handle these NF2 tumors? What, what can you tell them from... Uh, what we're learning in the literature. I think Ashok presented some uh, new. Right. I hard to pronounce them. <laughs> uh, what are they called? I forgot. Um, so you can, especially I know NF patients, you can try those uh, yeah. first. Yeah. I'm sorry, he's uh, not here with us. He he loves uh, this. Beba, Beba Zimo Cup, whatever they call it. There's so many of them. I cannot keep yeah. up. Uh, my question is before we. Talk about the VEGF inhibitors. Is that? Uh, yes, I think so. I, yeah. uh, he, he said it in his presentation, but uh, why does he have a, a, a papilledema bilaterally? I didn't appreciate much popul, uh, optic nerve swelling in the T2, or maybe I missed uh, because you were running. Um, I'm not sure. But okay. yeah, that's it's definitely papilledema, actually, which is why she we we kind of had to make a quick plan. And the neuroophthalmologist, you know, Dr. Lamb, very, very clear cut. Uh no, the yeah, I don't there is no hydrocephalus, correct, Matt? I don't remember. No, not really, no. And right. no venous hypertension, right? Uh, that as as far as we can see on this uh MRIs, you don't see any. Venous hypertension, no, not correct. hypertension, but venous occlusion, or okay. Um, and then you said, I mean, you showed the uh, temple bone CT, it's a high riding jugular bulb. And uh, so I think in this case, I think Dr. Tilishi also can talk more about this, but the uh, 
to make the any kind of hearing implant you i think is preserving the uh preserving the cochlear nerve will be important so uh, i think whatever you do at surgery extent of resection uh, uh your aim you try to preserve the cochlear nerve for future uh, uh hearing implant you, you mean of, you mean for a cochlear implant cochlear implant not for an a, not an not for an auditory brain implant no no right. uh, uh, so in this case my approach will be as as very large uh, uh canal and i'm really concerned about uh, uh, the jugular bulb and at the same time i want to preserve the cochlear nerve for cochlear implant i will do retrosigmoid with aim of aim of gross total or near total resection uh, fred before you give us your opinion i'm going to I'm reading one of the audience questions, Jose Carlos Casquera, who said, why not operate on the left ear first with a cochlear implant at the same time? Because she's going to lose the hearing on the right side anyway. So maybe you can educate our neurosurgical audience mostly, you know, about the thinking that goes in with the hearing rehabilitation. So, you know, I, I think... I mean, I, I don't see an option of leaving the, the right side tumor, giving the size of it uh, in, a, in a child. Um, Christine could give us her impression on how well the, uh, you know, the latest clinical trials for chemotherapy are working. Um, but I think it would be pretty miraculous to see, you know, a dramatic response in the tumor size on the right side. Certainly it's a possibility. Uh, and if the parents wanted to start with some chemo on a clinical trial, that would be something to consider. But short of that, I, I mean, I think we would all agree that you just have to remove the pressure on the brain stem on the right side. There's no way to preserve the cochlear nerve on that side. The speech discrimination is all already gone. I think it was 4%. So this, that would be a good side to attempt uh, auditory brain stem implant patient already has uh, you know, enough hearing loss on the left side to be a cochlear implant candidate. Uh, so it's not like a single-sided deafness or anything like that. So, uh, you know, and a young child, you know, hopefully has some years to live. Uh, I don't know if there's spinal tumors or other things that would be impacting the, the lifespan of this individual, but um, a try of an auditory brain stem implant, I think on the on the right with as much uh, completion of tumor removal would be good. Uh, and then obviously we would wanna do that via the TransLab approach, despite the, the higher jugular uh, bulb on that side. Uh, and then for the left side, uh, you know, you might even observe it and see if this tumor is a growing tumor. Uh, you can put a cochlear implant uh, on the side without doing any resection of tumor. Uh, and seeing how well the patient does. Um, you can certainly do an attempt at tumor resection and uh, cochlear implantation. <clears throat> um, you know, if you want to give that a try as well, once the patient has recovered from the right side. So there's a few different options there. Uh, they could even go into a clinical trial for chemotherapy once you've removed, uh, you know, the large uh, tumor mass on the right side. So lots of different options there. But a cochlear implant would be reasonable in some scenario on the left and an auditory brainstem response, uh, auditory brainstem implant uh, on the right. Great. Um, left side hearing also is severely diminished, right? Yes. Yeah, that's why we're talking about potentially a cochlear implant on that side with or without tumor removal. Right. Um, okay. Um, uh, Matt, you want to carry on what we did yeah Plus so we then my neurotology colleague and myself we performed a um, staged actually combined uh, trans lab and retro signal approach for the resection we did um place a auditory brainstem implant um <laughs> and then close with fat graft so as expected there was the high riding jugular bulb with the large sigmoid sinus and there may even be a hint of uh, sigmoid um diverticulum there so because of the limited um, corridor, we expanded the ex uh, approach during the second stage. We were able to resect 99% of the tumor, 
Um, but unfortunately, the facial nerve at the end of the surgery did not um, stimulate at uh, 0.2 milliamps at the brainstem uh, side. And then we uh, were able to uh, verify that 18 of the 22 contacts of the auditory brainstem implant were good uh, at the end of uh, the surgery. Um, and so here is um, on the left side, the CT scan after stage one, and then um, on the right side, the CT scan um, after um, tumor resection and placement of the implant that you can see. Uh, Matt, in, I don't know many in the audience may not be, may not have an ABI program. Maybe you can show them on this CT a little bit, the wire and where they're sitting. Yeah, of course. So the electrode, um, the paddle, so to speak, with the 22 contacts are placed um, through the uh, frame of Lushka, you know, into the fourth ventricle to be able to contact uh, the brainstem. And, um, and uh, during the surgery, uh, one can um, make adjustments <laughs> as needed to maximize the number of good contacts. And there's this wire that comes out, uh, and then there will ultimately be a um, a, a, a receiver um, that can be you know um, implanted uh, higher up on the on the scalp subcutaneously, um, and then the this uh, the rest of this is fat, and the fat graft here also helps to keep the contacts in place as well. Um, so here is the post op. Um, T1 with, uh, with and without contrast, and, um, and then T2 over here. And you can see here, anatomically, the you know, 70 complex was preserved, but unfortunately, the facial nerve function um, post-op immediately was uh, house bracket five on the right side. And uh, she underwent, uh, underwent eyelid uh, weight placement on post-op day six, and then was discharged home on post-op day seven. Um, here, kind of, you know, we're going to have more discussions about the post-operative course, but unfortunately, she came back post-op day 13 with headache, fever, vomiting, lethargy, essentially septic, um, and uh, we performed a lumbar puncture, and the CSF was consistent with uh, bacterial meningitis, uh, so we got a CT with contrast, uh, even though it didn't show a discrete abscess, but there was, um, you know, the enhancement pattern and the fast stranding was potentially um, concerning for um, possible infection. And um, so, you know, for the panelist, um, what would you do for this patient now? Uh, so Martin, um, you know, it, it was, I, I, just, I don't want to lengthen the conversation too much, but there seems to be evidence of perhaps uh, some purulent material and that required re-exploration. Do you think we can leave the ABI implant in spite of the infection and just do a washout? Or you think we should remove all foreign material because of infection? I, I have no experience with this, yeah. this situation, but uh, yeah, why not try the antibiotics and we will see. And uh, you can remove if, if not if not successful. But uh, I don't know. Yeah, Mustafa, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, what kind of uh, what what did cultures grow? Do you remember the organism, Matt? Yeah, so um, Klebsiella. Klebsiella. Klebsiella, yes. So that makes a big difference too, uh, in my opinion. Uh, <laughs> how mm. I don't have experience with the uh, brainstem implants, yeah. but how difficult to put it. Uh, I mean, of it's not scarring if you if you need to come back if you remove it. Uh, the, the results are less good, and we were it really was working very well. I mean, she uh, Christine uh, tested her, and she had she's one of the good responders early. I mean, we only have a result early, and uh, we had I think seventeen or eighteen of the twenty one electrodes were working. So it was a very good placement that. Uh, we hated to lose. Yeah. So uh, just Me again too. to shorten, essentially she was re-explored. I was out of town. Christine re-explored her with Carolina Benjamin and uh, wash out. Go ahead. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. So, you know, we had a discussion with the with with the parents too about, mm -hmm. you know, what they um, would prefer and the risks and benefits of leaving it in versus taking it out, the hardware. And ultimately, 
the mother really wanted to give the daughter uh, her only really good chance of uh, getting um, hearing. So the fat was taken out and then the pus was washed out and then a new fat grab was placed. Uh, and then she was put on antibiotics. Um, her blood cultures actually grew to Canada. So she was also given uh, antifungal as well. Um, and here's kind of the post-op CT scan. Um, and um, unfortunately, post-op day two, after the washout, she began leaking CSF um, from the wound. Um, I don't know if uh, I should just go ahead. And... No, it's okay. It's now it's becoming, you know, kind of genetic things, you know, yeah. lumbar drain, uh, exactly. a prolonged infectious disease. Uh, consultation, six weeks of antibiotics. Bottom line, we 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 got away without removing the ABI regarding infection. Uh, yeah, which is kind of against the usual principles of removing of foreign you know body in the middle of pus. But now I don't know that that will necessarily be the end of the story. But that's at least how we seem to be getting away with it early on. Um, yeah, I think, I think because it it happens so quickly that you know you know club scab is one of those bugs that has a high risk for biofilm forming on on plastic, but that takes weeks to form. So I think uh, because it was so quick and you guys got in there so quickly to repair it, hopefully that was not the case in this case. Yeah, yeah. So we you know we have um, it used to be as Jack mentioned you know the the, the <clears throat> standard just to remove any foreign material. So. With cochlear implants in particular, we used to just yank them out if there was an infection. Uh, but I think many of us now have experience where you can leave it in, you can irrigate with betadine, you know, antibacterial solutions. Um, if you can bring uh, vascularized tissue, I know you had to use a fat graft here, but if you can bring vascularized tissue in some way, occasionally even with a free flap, uh, you're you're better off because uh, you know then you don't have the non-vascularized fat there. So uh, you know, I, Christine and I spoke about this case a few times, and I'm so glad that you all were able to save the the brainstem implant since it was working so well. Uh, and you know, I, I think it's you know in selected cases you know, we are able to to preserve uh, those devices even in the face of infection. You're muted. Great. Yeah, I hear you. Thank you. Thanks for those remarks, Fred. Uh, let, let's now address the audience questions. Uh, just one more, one more thing. I just want to oh, point out in that case because uh, you know we do have that clinical trial going on. We talked yes. about it a little bit. So you know, brigatinib is the current kind of drug that has kind of some success in the trial. We just finished up one of our trials here. Christine ran it actually. It's a tyrosine kinase and FAC1 inhibitor. And so if those tumors were smaller and not having brainstem compression, and there was some idea of possibly preserving hearing, I think that would definitely, she would have been a really good candidate. I know that that was ruled out for this case, but there is some promising uh, developments coming through for these really challenging NF2 patients with bilateral tumors that are small. Exactly. Thank you, Mike. Um, okay. I'll, let me tackle a few of the questions. Uh, Ketan Bulsara, great to see you, my friend from uh, Yukon. Ketan is asking, let's ask Martin. Martin, by the way, are you still awake handling questions or, or you, you're yes. okay? <laughs> okay. Uh, I'll ask you this question from Ketan Bulsara. Seems a bit counterintuitive, but what biological characteristic makes cystic tumors more radiosensitive? Um, is, I, you know, that's what was mentioned earlier do you agree with that cystic tumors more radiosensitive or uh, you would have thought like the myth has always been that microsurgery is better for cystic tumors yet certainly gonziolka has mentioned the opposite a any any comments on radiosensitivity and cystic tumors i, I saw the article about this uh, in the first presentation right yeah and Yes, but the, I have no experience because we don't uh, irradiate the cystic tumors. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Mustafa, any comment? No, I, I don't think that's that's right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just gonna say simply, uh, uh, cystic tumors uh, uh, are also notorious for sudden expansions and sudden growth, and what 
promotes cystic for, cyst formation is probably micro hemorrhages in within the tumor. So I will be nervous uh, radiating the uh, any tumor, cystic tumor larger than two two centimeter. Mm. Okay. Question by David Croci. I'll summarize his question. What is the collective experience of the surgeons here of operating post gamma knife? Is it always difficult? Are there cases where it looks like gamma knife wasn't even done? What does the dissection plane look like? I'll, I'll, maybe I'll answer first myself. I mean, I've had both types. I've had cases where I ask myself, did they even give gamma knife? This plane looks really good. And of course, we've had those very scarred planes that made the dissection very difficult. Martin, what do you think? Uh, we have not many cases, uh, fortunately, because um, uh, in our country, we try to do the, the radical resection, but still I, I did a couple of pa uh, patients, but uh, some was good. I was uh, surprised that the, the, the plane was good and it, it was possible to do to, to do radical resection, but some was difficult, and the, and the nerve is more atrophic. So, yeah, so, so maybe the half of cases was very difficult, and half was surprisingly good for for me. Yeah, I I will agree. Think, with, I will agree with your statement. I think it's almost fifty fifty. Mm. Some cases are very good, like never had, and one advantage of it. Vascular parts of the tumor that receive the gamma knife, they are less vascular, as more pleasant the uh, debug. Uh, but sometimes I think it's related to the how they deliver and how close to the surrounding structures. It can be uh, the plane might be lost completely uh, if that borders receive the uh, significant more radiation. I don't I don't know the you know radio biology of these things, but uh, that's my experience. Mm -hmm. um, Eduardo Orego, can the Coos grade be used as an indicator for the decision of using radiosurgery alone or combined with microsurgical intervention? Mustafa, no. I know you love radiosurgery, so you're going to find any excuse <laughs> to do radiosurgery. No, no. I mean, it's, it's just <clears throat> depends on the patient. We cannot generalize these things. Uh, uh, you know, like Roberto Hero said, right? If you try to create an algorithm based on the who's great or that great is this great, uh, you can be harmful to that particular patient. So each patient is different. Uh, medical comorbidities, age, hearing status, size of the tumor, other anatomical features we mentioned. I wouldn't just base something uh, just strictly on one uh, uh, grade or tumor size. And while I have you talking, the next question by Mohammed Al Shar: What is the dose of nitroprusside? Do you know? Or I don't know. I, know the same same dose. Actually, they asked me when I gave the bypass talks. Yeah, I learned from this the cardiovascular surgeons. Yeah. I, I can provide it if that uh, uh, if uh, they privately email me. I, I have the formula in somewhere, but I I don't know if okay. nurses prepare that. Okay. Mustafa, do you use that for hearing preservation too? Because, uh, you know, we've shown and others have shown that vasospasm of the internal auditory artery can cause hearing loss during the dissection. And we use papaverine for that, but uh, I don't know if you use the same nitroprusside. I was using papaverine, Dr. Tillichip, but then for a while they stopped the papaverine production. And at that time, I started asking the other disciplines, what do you guys use instead of popper? And they said, oh, we have been using sodium nitroprusside so many years. And in bypass, when I do the, when I use the popper, and I noticed that that white flax on the vessels and nitroprusside doesn't give you that. And it's it's same, I think same way efficient. And, and I use it, yes, I use an any any tumor surgery, any surgery, I am very close and I manipulate the brain vessels. I use uh, sodium nitroprusside, including the for hearing preservation, facial, or any any other tumors. Uh, Martin, a technical question from Monica Quiroga about using the CUSA. Do you use the CUSA for acoustics uh, 
what your your comments as you get closer to the facial nerve what's your advice to to the audience yes i use i use the for debugging the cusa if you have a good percentage of the suction and uh, of the energy i think it's it's safe you can you can uh, regulate the, the the power and i i think it's safe my teachers they did it with uh, some mechanical debugging but, but i think the cusa is good and even if if we uh, prepare it very clear to the nerve i think if you have very low energy i, I have good good experience with this of course we can use also micro scissors if you need some very very and sharp section if you need some very very special and very uh, tiny uh, tiny debugging but but cusa yes i, I use a cusa I like it. Okay. I don't know if my other neuroautology colleague, Simon Angeli, is on, but Simon, if you're here, Dr. Jose Carlos Casquera from Spain says hi to you. Apparently, you're good friends. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Eva, I, when I lost the network, I lost the first few questions. In a second, I'm going to keep going, but I'll ask you to read in a few minutes the top two or three. Um, let me see. Uh, Dr. Uh, Fabian Romero, uh, blunt dissection, sharp dissection. Okay. Ah, okay. He's Dr. Fabian Romero wants more technical description of when to use blunt dissection, when to use sharp dissection subperineural so forth uh, uh, can you uh, maybe mustafa can you read discuss a little bit at what stage of the surgery you use blunt at what stage you use sharp i mean i think i told i, I, need, I, I know you said it but maybe uh, no no blunt dissection i mean uh, well, you, well you did say it's okay we all use it a little bit you did say it at one of your video i'm using blunt here and that's why I think some yeah. of the people got blunt dissection you. only away from the facial nerve and blunt dissection. If you need to do blunt dissection, uh, this is hard to develop these skills. This is be careful. You are using like Yashargi's uh, uh, spreading <clears throat> motions, but very quick, small strokes, not wide strokes, and you can do that very gently uh, and create the plane between nerve and the tumor. I'm talking about facial nerve. And same with the lower cranial nerves too, sixth nerve. But the fifth nerve is different. It's more tolerant to the uh, uh, traction. So always sharp or at least semi-sharp dissection around the facial nerve. And you, when you have these three centimeter, four centimeter tumors, that subperineural, that description is gone. I know some people talk about this, but I, I cannot tell you perineurium or anything like that i just see the nerve so uh, that's right you, you're right when they're giant that that doesn't exist anymore yeah, it's, i mean even the some moderate sized tumors you don't see anything but arachnoid plane they have arachnoid plane you preserve them there's no arachnoid plane you do your best by the way that description i can't remember the name of the first author it's a japanese colleague uh but it's actually wrong it should be sub epineurial it's it's Correct. not and but anyway everybody uses the term subperineural but should should be sub epineural epineural yeah um I, I, uh, he, oh uh, dr alim bayramov asking mustafa something a little unrelated but what's the advantage of the elite approach in comparison to retro sigmoid approach in case of jugular foramen schwannoma <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think Alim should email me this question later time. Okay. As unrelated to acoustic, as long of a discussion. Okay. So, Alim, if you heard him, email Mustafa. Thank you. Dr. Jose Nalino, there is a difference between the semi-sitting and lateral position. I guess he's probably asking it as a question. Is there a difference between semi-sitting? Yes, well, yeah, I'll, I'll answer my part. I don't use semi-sitting for acoustics. I just do 
the lateral position, you know, to avoid all the semi-sitting issues. And uh, I'm more comfortable and I, I don't have any issue with self-retaining retraction. I don't use them in acoustics. Uh, now, of course, you know, there are people like Marcos Tatajiba and uh, Ugur Ture who love the semi-sitting position and they've mastered it. Uh, and of course, Majid Sami, who, who pioneered it, but I don't know anybody else wants to comment. I, I, I use spine position, just spine head turn for translap or retrosigmoid. If patient has a short neck and very, I mean, body habitus is not favorable for that, you can put in, put lateral position. But uh, if I try to do semi-sitting position, two things. One, I don't like any position other than spine position. I don't like prone. I don't like sitting because it's not good for my shoulder or my back. And these surgeries you don't do in two hours. You you, you do the long, you work long hours. So second thing is if I try to do semi-sitting position, I do it in certain cases, but not acoustics. Then it takes two hours preparation because our anesthesiology team is not familiar is not well prepared for these things so and and spine works very well uh, martin any comments on positioning uh, we we do the small uh one of my great one two we do in the supine head lateral and the large one the, the grade four we do the semi-sitting position we have good experience from sami because we we visited many times in 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 Hanover, and so <clears throat> yeah, yeah, we we see see some advantages be, because there is CSF going down, and and you have more hands in this position because you don't, don't, don't need the suction. Yes, but yeah, we prefer the for a large vestibular schwannoma sitting position. Uh, Eva, I, I, those are all the questions I have because I lost network. Uh -huh. I know at the beginning there were a few. Yeah, Can so uh, there's two other questions. So Dr. Aleem Bayramov asked two other questions. So the first one was to Dr. Astagiri. Uh, it was... Why well, he's is, not here. Yeah, what, I mean, what's the I question? Think some of the other presenters maybe will answer. Uh, what is the best management of patients over 65 years old with bilateral acoustic schwannomas with trigeminal trigeminal and facial nerve involvement in cases of neurofibromatosis type 2 with previous history of stroke? Well, you're asking a very complicated and pretty impossible question to answer in a, you know, without real specifics. I'm not sure any of us can give you a generic answer, Aline. Maybe what, when you email Mustafa, you can torture him with that question as well, and you can enjoy <laughs> answering it. <laughs> I'll, I'll answer it, Jack. Go, go ahead. Chemotherapy. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> chemotherapy. Uh, chemotherapy. Okay. Yeah, and then his other question was to Dr. Sames, which was, uh, which surgical approach is better for acoustic neuromas in case of compression on the vagal and hypoglossal nerves? About what? About uh, acoustic neuromas. So, what surgical approach do you think is better for acoustic neuromas that compress the vagal and hypoglossal nerve? Uh, does it change anything? I mean, you're going to take it out anyway. Yeah, but, there's always compression, right? I mean, this uh, yes. is not that <laughs> we, it's and... easy, easy answer because we do only retrosigmoid approach. We, <laughs> <laughs> right. We we don't use the translap and middle fossa also we don't use so we do we do retrosig. Uh, you can uh, you can do both. I mean retrosig or translab is, is yeah we can do both, uh, but we prefer you this. Can, you can control all these nerves easily. The what mm. what approach is not important, Alim? How you dissect them is important. Don't get stuck with these uh, approaches. Yeah, and for the audience, I mean, when my residents ask me, like, what is the hardest surgery that you kept learning? I always tell them acoustic neuroma is the operation where, like, the longest learning curve for me, well into my attending years, I kept learning and learning little difficult things, not the petrochlival meningioma and bypasses, but acoustic neuromas, those subtleties, you really only learn with more cases that you do. It's been it's been my experience. Yeah, We're still learning. Yes, same. yes, same.
name. The, re I think the main reason makes it difficult, in my opinion, and the outcome parameters, e even in small ones, either hearing preservation or just cosmetic outcome parameters. We are not talking about hemiparesis saving lives, right? Face and the hearing, uh, sensory and the most important motor function for outlook. So it's just all cosmetic outcome parameters. Any comments from any of the panelists to anybody else before we close the session? Yeah, I think Mustafa made a nice comment related to the, the outcome of these patients. And, uh, you know, you, you really have to look at your own experience, your own center, <clears throat> uh, your own outcomes, um, and be honest about them with yourself and with your patients. Because as Mustafa mentioned, uh, you know, you, patients these days won't tolerate severe complicated <coughs> outcomes, you know, unless it's a really huge tumor with some other preoperative complicated issues. Uh, you know, it's, it's not cosmetic surgery, but it's sort of approaches the philosophy of that, in that if you're going to do something, you know, you really have to have a high chance of a good outcome because doing nothing is, a, is an option uh, and doing some type of radiation is an, op is an option in, in many cases, not all cases. So, you know, I, I think we all need to keep that in mind all the time. You know, what's compelling us to do something really invasive for this patient and are we confident that the outcome is gonna be good? That was a nice panel. Thank you all for including me. Of course. Well, it's just past seven o'clock, so Thanks, and thanks for my our neuroautology group for joining us and enriching the session. And uh, thanks, everybody. Um, um, Martin, go to bed. And uh, thank you. Good to see you. Thank Bye. you, Martin. Thank, thank you, Dr. Morcos. Thank, thank you. you. Good to see you, Martin. Dr. Telishi. See you soon, I hope. See you. <laughs> yes. See you. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. <laughs>